Hello, everybody. I'm Peter Van Hoesten from the South African National Bioinformatics Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to this walkthrough through the M tuberculosis variance analysis tutorial. As you can see from my screen, I'm starting here with a, a session on Galaxy, use galaxy.eu, but this will work on several Galaxy servers. And I don't have anything in my history, and I'm going to just rename my history to m tuberculosis variance analysis. And then because I want to use the same window for uh, following the tutorial and for um, doing my work in Galaxy, I'm going to use the scholar hat button here. And I'm going to look for the tutorial by just searching for tuberculosis. And here we have it in tuberculosis variance analysis. So I will leave you to read through the introductory uh, um, <clears throat> text at your own time. And uh, then if I scroll down to the first hands-on part where it says get your data. So we can just copy these links from here. Now I'm going to click away from the tutorial window. And I'm going to go to the upload data view. I'm going to click paste fetch data. Then I'm going to paste these links into this window and click start. And I notice that immediately some activities happened here in the Galaxy window. This is all gray. Uh, that means that these jobs are waiting to run. And what it's actually doing is downloading these um, files from the links that I pasted into the window that you just saw. Uh, here, uh, on the left hand side, you will see some uh, Galaxy user interface features that um, might be unfamiliar to you. That's because I'm using the uh, beta version of the Galaxy user interface. So uh, it is June 2024. If you come back in a few months, you might all be familiar with these um, uh, icons in my sidebar. Uh, but uh, other people might just see the tools uh, like it is showing over here. So the gray went into yellow. That means that uh, or orange, depending on how you see this, that means that the download of these data sets is uh, busy taking place. So I will pause the recording while we wait for that uh, download to, to happen. I'm going to be making this recording in different segments uh, as I pause during long running jobs and so on. Okay, so we can see that uh, it's now green and these data sets have been loaded. We can look here in the uh, eye icon, the view icon to see what has been loaded. So we've got two sets of fast gear reads. We've got the mycobacterium tuberculosis ancestral reference genome you know, in GenBank format. So, um, <clears throat> what we've got here is the mycobacterium tuberculosis reference genome that is from the H37RV strain of tuberculosis uh, with its annotation. That's what you get in GenBank format. So, if you look at the file, you see that there's lots of annotation about where genes are located. But the sequence that we've got is not the H37RV sequence from uh, NCBI or European Nucleotide Archive. Uh, it is rather the inferred ancestral sequen sequence as computed by Commerce et al. And then separately, we've got the uh, annotation here in GFF format. This is just the genes and where they're located uh, in the genome. Uh, but the first step that we need to do is look at the quality of our uh, sequence reads here. So this is Illumina sequencing. We have forward reads and reverse reads over there. Um, and uh, then I'm going to go back into the tutorial, follow the instructions, and say it says run FastQC. So I'm going to click this. It opens the FastQC window. Now FastQC can work on multiple um, data sets at once. So I'm going to click this button. and the user interface for Galaxy has changed a little bit here. Using older Galaxies, you'll need to control click to select multiple items. But in the newer Galaxy interface, you can just click here in the blank space 
and then choose the other data set. So we're going to work on uh, the two data sets here. Click Run Tool. And we'll notice that um, jobs get started for both of our uh, uh, Fastly data sets. So we see here FastQC on data one, raw data, that's the more machine interpretable data from FastQC. And then FastQC on data one web page, that is the web page we could view. And the same things for uh, data two and data two. So we see that that's data set one and data set two. Those are the FastQ um, entries there. The FastQ format from a sequencer. But also if we click on the button here, expand the, uh, the, the click on the title to expand the, um, the view of the data set. We've also got the show related items and then it zooms in to show this came from this. So it makes it easy for us to track which um, data sets came from which other data sets. Uh, and you'll see that it put related five. That's data set five over here, showing what is related to data set five here at the top. So I'm going to delete that so that I can see all of my data sets again. So here we see that the um, FastQC processing is finished. Um, Often we're processing multiple um, data sets together and uh, with kind of a quality control tool like FastQC. And it's useful to be able to combine these together into a consolidated report, the outputs of FastQC. So for that, we to go back to the tutorial and it says we can run a thing called multi-QC. So I click on that, it opens the um, multi-QC um, form. The first thing I notice is that um, Multi-QC can work on lots of different um, QC tools as output. So I must select the correct uh, tool here, which is FastQC. And then it gives me this button here, Insert FastQC Output. It has already selected one of them, that is Dataset 8. And I click Next to this thing and select Dataset 6, which is the raw data from the other one. So this is FastQC on Data 1 and FastQC on Data 2. So now my multi-QC run is finished. So let's have a look at the multi-QC output. So firstly, we have some overall statistics, 5.3 million sequences in both the forward and reverse data sets. Um, a high proportion of duplicate sequences probably from uh, amplification during the process of uh, library construction. And uh, we see here the GC content. So the GC content is a percentage of the reads which are Gs and Cs, and it's characteristic of a particular species. Um, and then we can look at the sequence counts, where it shows us a kind of a bar graph of total sequence counts and duplication. And then down here at the bottom, there's the sequence quality histogram. And so we see that the quality is in the green zone above 30 for both forward and reverse reads, with a few dips from here to there. Um, and then before dipping uh, down to the end. This is characteristic of, characteristic of luminary reads, that they uh, tend to have better quality uh, at the start, a little bit not so great right at the start, but better quality at the start, and then they dip down towards the end. And we can see that these are 100 base pair reads. And then it looks at the um, mean quality scores uh, for the reads in general. And we find that most of them are sitting here in around 36. That's really good quality. Um, and then some information on the per base sequence content. And uh, we just see some issues at the start of the reads. Um, yeah. And the Galaxy has a dedicated tutorial on quality control. So you can go through that to understand this output a bit better. So going back to the tutorial, do we think that pre-processing the reads will be necessary before mapping? The quality is already pretty good, but it can uh, benefit from a little bit of uh, pre-processing. And then what's the average GC content of the data? So if we look at the solutions, then um, we see that the average GC content uh, is 66%, which is close to the 65.6% that we expect from an M tuberculosis sample. So 
I always pay attention to this because, uh, you know, if you want to know, have you really sequenced mycobacterium tuberculosis? Then look at the GC content. And contamination is going to throw up in the form of a change in the GC content of um, the sequence. Only if that is gross contamination, of course. But uh, it, it can sometimes uh, be a quick and easy quality control step to just check this GC content. Now that we've seen that there are a few small quality problems uh, with our data, we can move on to resolving these uh, by using a tool called FastP. FastP uh, automatically trims the poor quality bases uh, and, of course, the sequencing adapters, that's very important, uh, out of your data. Uh, so here's FastP. We're going to say that our input should be paired because we've got both, for, both forward and reverse reads. So, so set it up like that, and we will leave all the other options to be at the default values. <clears throat> Once we finish this, we will have ready to analyze data. So if we've started with the raw data out of the sequencer, we've tested its quality using FastQC, and now we're doing quality trimming using FastP. Since FastP also produces a uh, before and after sequence quality report. That's this HTML report over here. Um, but uh, because the Galaxy materials on quality trimming uh, focus on the use of FastQC, and um, because uh, its uh, web pages are quite straightforward to read, I focused on just visualizing with uh, FastQC. But later on in the tutorial, we'll only be using Fast P when we need to um, handle uh, either visualizing or trimming quality um, from our uh, sequencing data. So as I mentioned, there's the HTML report that you can see from Fast P, and it gives some statistics that uh, is a little bit similar to um, what's in Fast UC, and with some differences. But besides that, if we go back to the tutorial. There's a question, was there a difference in the file size of the reads before and after trimming? Is the difference the same between both sets of reads? So let's go have a look. If we go to the input reads, the number one reads, the forward reads, we see that it was 494 megs coming in. And if I click on the title of the other one, it was 489 megabytes coming in. Now, if we look at the final trimmed reads, so read one output, 396 megabytes, remember this was 494. So we've lost about 100 megabytes worth of uh, data in the quality trimming process. This is something to, to note that quality trimming means removing data. It means, in this case, removing um, poor quality data. Uh, but we always do need to be aware that this is a process which uh, loses data. So in certain applications, uh, you don't do quality trimming, but in the, here where we have more than enough reads, then we trim the low quality reads uh, so that they don't um, create, for instance, incorrect uh, variant calls later on. So anyway, so this dropped almost 100 megabytes and 397, 396, very similar size. So the remaining high quality data um, is quite different in size to the incoming data, but it's about the same for both forward and reverse reads. And that kind of makes sense because the reads are paired. There's a forward going one way and a reverse going the other way. So at this point, we can choose to run Kraken 2. Kraken 2 is a, a tool that's used for um, identifying the likely species that a read comes from. Uh, I'm going to skip this step at this point because it's quite a long running tool. I'll show you later what a Kraken 2 uh, run looks like. Um, but when you're doing the tutorial for yourself, uh, you can choose to run it and then um, leave it running and carry on with the rest of the tutorial um, <clears throat> and come back to its results in the end. But anyway, so then we're going to move on to Snippy. So Snippy takes uh, bacterial um, reads designed around bacterial reads and aligns them to a reference genome. 
uh, and then it caused variants, caused single nucleoside variants and small insertions and deletions. Okay. Um, and uh, if we give it a reference as in GenBank format, it will call a tool called SNP EFF that will figure out the effects of the change. So it won't just say that there is, for instance, a C changing to a T, but it will look at where in the gene this is happening and whether uh, this is making an amino acid change and so on and so forth. So it's quite useful to feed a GenBank format genome into SNP. And as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, annotated reference built from the inferred microbacterium to the closest ancestral reference genome. And the gene annotation is uh, used from the H37RB strain. So there have been a few uh, different projects trying to infer the, what, uh, the ancestors of modern um, microbacterium tuberculosis lineages look like. Um, and this particular one that we use for in Archicomas and others uh, is. Um, designed to have the same coordinates. So you can use the annotation that is in um, the A37 coordinate uh, scheme, uh, but then with the DNA basis from this ancestral reference genome. And there have been other projects looking at the ancestral state of the inferred ancestor of microbacterium tuberculosis lineages that have added and removed parts of the sequence, which uh, would then mean that we can't directly use the gene annotation from H37RB, so it would make our lives more difficult. But anyway, so we've got our reference genome, and for uh, microbacterium tuberculosis, we are uh, essentially always using this reference genome, and then we need the tool, and let's look at the options that we're going to use. So we're not going to use a built-in genome uh, uh, index. We're going to use a genome from the history and build the index, and it already suggests the gene bank uh, um, format one. And then we're going to use the read one and read two outputs, not the raw reads, but the read one and read two outputs from um, a fast P. Um, and then in, in advanced parameters, by default, um, SNPI discards variants which have less than 90% of the um, reads uh, supporting that variant. But because we want to see a wider um, variety of reference, I'm going to drop this down to 0.1. Uh, the If you leave it at the default, the advantage is that you only get the um, uh, variants that are really fixed in the uh, genome. In other words, um, when we are sequencing a colony, we're always sequencing some degree of genetic diversity, but when we say 0 0.9, and I was 90% of the reads must agree, then we are uh, saying that we want the variants that really are showing up um, in all of the cells that we are sequencing. Whereas when I say 0 0.1, the, the danger of this is that um, we might get more variants that are real variants, but we might also get um, uh, a higher chance of being mis uh, misled by sequencing errors. However, because we are asking for a minimum coverage of 10, hopefully we won't have um, sequencing uh, errors in this um, uh, data set. And then down here at the bottom, we're not going to use these zip files from Snippy for Snippy Core, uh, but later on, we do want the alignments in BAM format. So we're going to keep those. So you can set it up like that and then run the tool. Uh, Snippy takes a little while to run, so again, I'm going to pause the recording while um, Snippy does his work. I, can show you, uh, I want to show you a useful feature of Galaxy, which is that we don't need to wait for a job to finish before we can use its output. So we see here we've got a VCF file, a BAM file, and so on. And if you look in the tutorial, um, skipping over these questions, the um, next thing that we are going to want to do is variant filtering. So one of the problems that we have with uh, microbacterium tuberculosis is that the genome has several repetitive regions, um, for instance, the PEPBE genes, um, and uh, that makes it difficult for um, short reads, and we've got reads of 100 base pairs here, but you know, even getting up to 150, 250 base pairs, uh, if uh, the mapper finds two parts of the genome that look the same because they're repetitive, then it doesn't know where to place the read. So um, 
typically we filter out reads that map to these um, difficult to map reads of uh, the genome. Uh, and there's a tool for this, TB variant filter. And so we can set it up and then say that we wanted to run on the VCF output of a SNPI. And I said filter out by regions, and that the regions by default are um, chosen from a recent piece of work by Maha Farhat's lab, to which regions to filter. And I also want to um, filter out by read alignment depth. So something similar to what uh, Snippy did, but these are just some filters that you can apply. You can look into the help of the tool to understand more about uh, what all the options for filtering are. So when I click run on this tool, it's gray, not because it's queued waiting to be given a chance to run, but because it's waiting for uh, output 17 here, the, um, the PCF file from Snippy to become available so it can then start doing its work. Okay, so my snippy is finished, so I can go back to the questions being asked. So let's see, what type of variant is the first one in the list? So in fact, I've got two lists of variants. I've got the VCF file, and VCF is a fairly standard format for um, uh, <clears throat> annotating variants. And as you can see, it is a little bit complex to read, but it has a lot of information into it. But what also has the same information is the SNPs table. And we can see that the first um, SNP we've got is a substitution from a C to a T at position 2,532 in the uh, H37 of the coordinate system. Um, <clears throat> so what was the effect of this variant? Well, uh, can we see that from this file? Um, yes, we can see that uh, this was in a coding region. In the positive strand, there is a coding region in that position. Um, and uh, we can see that this was, in fact, a synonymous variant. So changing the C to a T uh, did not uh, change the amino acid at this position. <coughs> So um, as I said, TB variant filter ran automatically after SNPI completed and it did its filtering. And how many of the regional variants have been filtered out? Well, let's see what the answer is by looking at uh, the output. It says it marked 131 of these. So we can see that, uh, as I explained earlier, TB variant filter ran after a SNPI um, using the VCF file as input. And if we click on the title, we can see that it masked 131 of the variants. Um, they were removed. That's a, about uh, a little bit more than 10% of uh, the total variants were masked by TB variant filter. <clears throat> so obviously with mycobacterium tuberculosis, one of the things that we really are interested in is the um, the drug resistance profile. Um, and uh, then also there's a tool called TB variant report that uh, makes it somewhat prettier, um, a list of variants. So we're gonna start by running TB profiler. Um, that's a tool by Jody Phelan um, that uh, uses a database of um, known uh, drug resistance causing mutations to uh, predict um, likely drug resistance in your tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis sample. So uh, it can run straight from the fast queue, but we're going to use the fact that we've already got the aligned BAM from SNPI. Um, and then uh, there is an option to run in silico polytyping, but I'm going to leave that off. I rather want the lineage typing that you get from um, <clears throat> Uh, TB profiler, and so let's run that. Okay, it produces a report. It produces its own VCF file, which is of uh, variants in the um, drug resistance uh, genes, um, and it uh, produces a uh, output in machine readable JSON format, which we'll use for the <clears throat> final tool in our tool chain. But 
to run the final tool node tool chain, the TB variant report, uh, then we need to deal with one thing that Snippy does here on the um, BCFs. Uh, as I said, it annotates the um, impact of these uh, variants um, on the um, amino acids. But then when it refers to um, uh, genes, it does things like this. It inserts a gene underscore name over there. And uh, the tool we want to run at the end doesn't want those. So I'm going to use um, the uh, text transformation tool with this little program. If you're familiar with uh, command line tools, it's a thing called said. Um, and I'm going to run this transformation that removes the uh, gene underscore wording. And I'm going to run this on the output of TB variant filter, which is our complete variant list. Remember that the uh, VCF file from um, TB profiler is only variants in the drug resistance genes that it's looking at. Okay, so that's fine just to run like that. TB profiler is still running. Text transformation is busy, is going to start running soon. And so let me get to the last tool of this part of the tutorial which is the TB variant report that uses a database uh, called Combat TB NeoDB to pull in some extra information about the um, genes that it's um, uh, reporting on. And uh, it doesn't have to use the TB profiler outputs, but in this case, I'm going to use them. And so then when I click go, this will wait for the preceding tools to finish running. So all the tools have finished running, and let's answer some of the questions that we've got here. Firstly, from the drug resistance report, that is the one from TP Profiler, and uh, the profile report, which we can either get as PDF or text format. This one is in text format. So the first question was, uh, what was the final lineage of the sample we tested? Um, and uh, it says here at the top. And what it does is it uh, looks at the sub lineage all the way through to the um, most general lineage. And so it said that this is a lineage 4, specifically 4.4. Um, and uh, more than 99% of uh, the lineage de defining um, variants agreed with this and then down to this most detailed sub lineage 4.4.1.1.1 the part of the euro american lineage 4 uh, and almost 100 percent of the lineage defining variants were found so what this means is this there's a list of so-called um uh, barcoding um positions where uh, lineages all have particular variants there and uh, this agreed with the pattern that we expect to see for this sub lineage almost 100 percent and then the next question um, was there any drug resistance found indeed there was um we can see that this is in fact a, a, a sample that shows resistance or at least predicts resistance from the genomic data against uh, all of the first line drugs, we spoke with Vampersent, it's resistant, isomalizumide is resistant, ethambutol, peridinamide, Um, So this is multi drug resistant tuberculosis that, that we are looking at. And then down here below, we see the specific um, variants, the position of the genome, uh, the affected um, locus or gene name. And oh, what type of variance it is, what amino acid change it was, and uh, what the drug associated um, with uh, resistance of this position is. And uh, yeah, so we um, also see some other uh, variants that are interesting, but they're not associated with resistance. And then we can move on to the output from TB variant report. So it has both a text and an HTML output. I'm going to look at the HTML output. 
And we can see here that this is the drug resistance report formatted as HTML. And then the variant report in HTML looks like this, gives us the lineage information and all of the variants. But what's quite nice here is that uh, you can um, follow this link and you get taken to the corresponding page in the Combat TV near DB uh, database. So this was looking for that uh, particular protein product. That it's over there. And if we go click on that, then that uh, is known as the gene DNA N. We see where it is in the genome browser over here. Uh, we can see its um, actual sequence, and down here at the bottom, we find some information about the gene, what it does, and so on and so forth. And you can find out all this information for all of the variants that are uh, listed in um, the variant report here, which is, remember, this is coming from the filtered VCF report. So uh, this database, the Combat to be uh, Explorer NeoDB, is a database that um, has information about all the various mycobacterium tuberculosis genes. <clears throat> okay, moving on to the next and final part of uh, the main tutorial. Um, so we've got all this information about um, that they uh, um, are some variants and they're involved in resistance or not, as the case may be. But what if we want to look at the um, reads and how they provide evidence for this in more detail? So for that, we're going to use a tool called um, uh, uh, JBrowse, the genome browser. But um, first, we need to get a fast A format version of uh, the uh, reference genome. So we need to use Google Secret. Uh, that just does format conversion. And um, so we can scroll down here to the GenBank file. It accepts all sorts of files, so that's why it gave us so many things in the list there. And we're going to convert this to FASTA. So let that run. And it will take a few seconds to uh, get going. OK, there it's going. And now, going back to the tutorial, we're going to use JBrowse. So I'm going to look for JBrowse. Um, and I could have looked for these tools all along by just searching for them here, JBrowse. Uh, but what's nice about uh, the tutorial interface is I can just click on the name and it opens it for me automatically. Uh, so which genome? Now, we're not going to use a built-in genome. We're going to use a genome from the history. That's the secret output. This is a bacteria. So we're going to change this to the bacterial code. And now we need to insert a track group. And just going back to the tutorial, the first track group is going to be called sequence reads. So I'm going to call this sequence reads. And I'm going to insert a track. And in this case, I'm going to choose that it must be BAM format. So it picks up the BAM format from Snippy. I don't need a SNP track uh, because I've got the SNP data as well. I want this to be on for new users and leave the rest of it as it is. Now a new track group. The second track group is called variants. And here I'm going to choose the type of VCF. And I'm actually going to choose the <clears throat> outputs of TP variant filter because I don't need that change from uh, the text processing that I did. And I'm going to put this one to be on for new users as well. And one last track group, and I'm going to call this one annotated reference. And here I'm going to insert the CFF3 annotation for the genome. 
Um, and I'm going to go to this and I'm going to switch it to Canvas features. And I'm going to use advanced styling options, just following the tutorial. Um, the Canvas features, and I'm going to change the style label and the description to product and product. So that's down here. Change the style label and the description. We need to call this product. This just changes some of the display of the annotation tracks. Let's check that all my results are as expected. Yes, this should also be on for new users. Now that all of those options are um, selected, I can click Run Tool and wait for the <clears throat> my genome browser, which runs inside Galaxy, to be uh, created for me. Tutorial, what we expect to see at the end of um, our um, processing is something that looks a bit like this. This, is, in fact, is a live preview of um, the uh, browser that we're going to see. Uh, so let's click on um, the eye icon and see what we see in our GM browser. It takes a little while to load. And despite what we asked for, most of the tracks are in fact switched off when I open the browser for the first time. So I'm switching them all on using this bar here on the um, left. And now I'm just waiting for it to load. And so we see here, this uh, has already started at this position. Um, and these, this tracks here at the top is the annotation. So I'm just going to zoom way out so that we can see in a little bit more detail what's going on here. So the top line is just the chromosome, the whole chromosome of um, the bacteria. But below it, we see uh, the genes of um, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So there's uh, some forward genes. This one over here is RV0666. And then there is a gene on the native strand, RV0662C. And at this level, we don't see the uh, reference uh, genome because it's but we don't see the reads because we are zoomed out too far. But let's go back to the tutorial. And it asks us to go to this position. So let's copy this. And paste it in here. And click go. Here we are back somewhat similar to where we started. And we see a red line going down here. And well, what is that red line? That red line, uh, if we scroll right to the bottom of the screen, is in fact the variance in each individual read. These are the individual sequencing reads, forward and reverse. And we see that compared to the reference genome, almost all of them have a variant at this position. And that variant, as the VCF track shows us, is a change from a C to a T. And there's some more questions in the tutorial that I'm not going to answer for you. You can explore them for yourself. So uh, we could also use the external genome browser called IGV, but uh, I will leave things here. So this is the end of the main part of the tutorial. We've taken our uh, sequencing reads, We've mapped them against, we've done quality control, then we've mapped them against the genome called variants. Then we have uh, filtered the variants, the TB variant filter, um, predicted drug resistance for a TB profiler, and finally visualized both the variants with TB variant report, and now the entire genome with JBrowse. And that shows you how you can do analysis of a sample of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, and what I've chosen here is a fairly good sample. The rest of the discussion will be on uh, some not so great samples. And then finally, 
on how to automate this entire process. Because if you had 20 variants, I mean, 20 samples to process, you wouldn't want to go through um, this long manual process for each of them. There, there is a, a system of so-called workflows in Galaxy that you can use to automate um, the running of uh, a new analysis. Now, if we finish the main part of the tutorial, I can move on to some of the additional or bonus content that uh, I haven't looked at before. So I'm going to start off by going back to the Kraken step that I skipped earlier. And uh, so this is going to run Kraken on the fast P output from uh, our data. So I click here to get the Kraken tool up and make it paired. And now the input's going to be fast me and read one and fast me and read two. Um, and I wanted to print scientific names uh, in the uh, main output. Um, and then I want to choose this uh, database standard plus partisan fungi. There's a few versions of this, but this one will be good enough from 2021. But the main thing is standard, which is bacteria um, and viruses plus partisan fungi. And then I wanted to create a report. Yes, I don't want to just classify the reads, but also create a report on the reads. And I'm going to run this tool, which, as I mentioned earlier, takes quite a while to run. And I'm going to move on to another section of the tutorial. <clears throat> so I'm moving down to past where we did the JBRAS step. And now I'm going to look at different samples, different stories. So. Let's start off with these samples, 0181 samples. So I'm going to load these into my history. Click Upload Data, uh, Paste First Data, and paste these links. And once again, it's going to go and fetch uh, these um, files from Zenodo and put them into the Galaxy server, which I'm running these analyses on. Okay, our two samples have been loaded uh, and uh, we can run fast QC on them and then crack it. So, And after fast QC, just to make it easier to visualize things, I'm going to run multi QC as well. Multi-QC will run when this uh, has finished running. And uh, I'm going to run a Kraken analysis, but I'm going to make my life a little bit easier. Instead of choosing all of the options from scratch, I'm going to choose my existing Kraken run, and I'm going to use the rerun button over here, because that'll circle with an arrow. And then instead of running on the data that this is now running on, I'm going to switch this to run on my new data sets. This means that I don't need to set all the rest of the options. You'll notice that uh, the database and everything is set as it was for this run. So I'm just reusing this as a kind of prototype of a run. And then I click run. And then I go make myself a cup of coffee because this will take some time to complete. While I wait for the new analyses to run, I notice that my Kraken uh, analysis on the original data is completed. And Kraken produces two outputs. This one is a classification of each individual read. So we see here the read name, what has been classified as, and the source of the evidence over here. But more interesting for us is this report. <clears throat> and we can see that 90, 
0.6% of the reads from this original sample. Remember, this was the uh, 004 sample, 004 hyphen 2 sample got classified as mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, which is what we expect from a sample like this. This is pure culture of mycobacterium tuberculosis. So we would expect this high uh, proportion <clears throat> um, to be associated here. Not all the way down to mycobacterium tuberculosis, because how Kraken works is that it, if uh, a read looks like um, multiple um, sequences, it will shift the read up the tree. So because many members of the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, remember this is um, mycobacterium Bacterium tuberculosis, um, Mycobacterium africanum, etc. Um, they look very similar. So then reads get shifted uh, away from the individual, since so restrict to Mycobacterium tuberculosis up to um, Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. Um, but we see that um, this is where uh, almost all of the reads were classified. <clears throat> At the time of this recording, um, the scheduling of my multi QC jobs uh, seems to be stuck. So I'm going to see if I can uh, crack in jobs or seems to be stuck. I'm seeing if I can move on to the next step of the tutorial um, and then come back to discuss the um, 0181 0, 0, results later. So here's another set of data uh, with some slightly different problems than the previous set. And this will let me see where the Galaxy really is stuck, and if so, I'll need to report this to the Galaxy um, administrators. Yeah, those do, in fact, run. So I'm not quite sure why these uh, are not running, um, but I'll get back to them later. <clears throat> so again, it's loading these uh, this data, but in this case, from uh, the European Nucleotide Archive, not from um, Zenodo. Uh, these are full-sized, um, uh, real mycobacterium tuberculosis um, sequencing data sets, by the way. <clears throat> okay, for this uh, data, um, I want to actually uh, do some quality trimming and then map it against the reference genome. So I'm going to start with FASTP. And I'm going to switch this to paired end. Uh, the first data set and the second data set from the sample. And then I'm going to go here to Snippy. Mm -hmm. And the key thing here is that must take in these reads. Read one, read two. The reference genome should be from my history, which is the, I'll use the Jingbank one, not the FASTA one. Um, and I really want to see the BAM output of this, so I will click that and leave that to run. Meanwhile, I'm meanwhile I'm not actually sure what's happened here. Samsung's Galaxy scheduler just gets stuck, so I am going to. Um, Take the multi QC output here, the web page output, and I use these parameters to rerun the tool and see if it will run the second time around and do the same thing with Kraken. And you see this time around, it is in fact running. There's Kraken running, it's multi QC. So um, <clears throat> I'm doing this at a time when Galaxy uh, is uh, running quite a lot of things at the moment. So it might be that. I just don't have enough slots allocated to me to run all the jobs that I want to run, but there's Snippy running, RTQC is finished. So while Snippy runs, let's look at this. Now, remember, if I go here and I ask what is this related to, then it says, okay, this is past QC, and what is that related to? And it shows that um, this past QC is related to these 0, 18, one sample. So I can see all the way through um, with the relatedness of things. And then I'm going to click here in the view and just see what can we see about the 018 um, 
one data set. I'm just going to go back to the relevant part of the tutorial. Um, and if we look at this um, uh, <clears throat> data set, then we notice that compared to the previous data set we were looking at, the quality drops below 30 a lot quicker than um, we saw in the um, uh, other data sets. Um, and um, I'm just going to take this away so I can see my entire history. Kraken is busy running. I I'll see what Kraken says when it's finished. So over here, um, the, the, we can see that particularly, particularly towards the end, there are quite a few errors. Um, well, no, not I won't say them errors, but uh, poor quality sequencing, which could mean there are errors here in the data set. So dropping below 20, which is unusual for Illumina reads. Uh, these are 250 base pair reads. They are longer than uh, the data set we worked with earlier, which probably is also why they have more opportunity to drop below uh, to low quality here at the end. Um, if you remember, the other data was about 100 base pairs. So it was still sitting here uh, in the 30s. But here we definitely have issues towards the end. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so my snippy is running. Uh, my Kraken is running. I need to take another break. Remember, this snippy over here is dealing with um, the fast P output, which in turn is coming from uh, this SRR12416842 sample. So that's how I can see what uh, history items are related to other ones. So I'm going to delete this again so I can see my entire history. And there the Kraken classification is finished. Remember, this is back to the 0018.1. And let's see what the report shows. And we here we can see that only less than 60% of the reads are able to be classified as mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. If we uh, scan further through, we see uh, there's little um, numbers, but if we scroll further down, we do see that some other reads are uh, classified, maybe 6% uh, to some other species. So there's definitely something wrong with this data set. Uh, we saw the quality is not great, so that um, there seems to be what could be some contamination or just some inability to actually assign these reads well to mycobacterium tuberculosis. So we need to consider are we going to use this data? If we do call reads, if we do call variants from this data, how accurately will it be calling variants? Um, I don't have an answer for that right now. We have to do further analysis. Um, but uh, this does illustrate that Kraken is a very useful tool for do, for seeing <coughs> issues with uh, the data set. We expect this uh, figure over here to be at least over 80% mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. SNPI is still running on the SRR uh, data set from um, <clears throat> uh, uh, that we downloaded from ENA. So I will have some more coffee while I wait for that to finish running. Okay, so the SNPI output from <clears throat> the uh, SRR data set has uh, completed. Um, and so let's have a look at the fast P output for this. In the HTML report, what does it say about the sequence quality? So GC content about 66. And <clears throat> down here that we can see that 140 base pairs, still reasonably decent uh, quality here on read one. Uh, not so great on read two. So dropping below 30 down to mid 20s over here. But still not terrible. But then let's have a look at the snippy, um, snip stable. And what we see here, one, 17,415 lines. That's, uh, uh, that's not what we expected. Okay. This is a very, 
a, a high number of SNPs. We we saw about a thousand SNPs um, in the previous data set that we mapped, and here we're seeing all sorts of uh, um, <clears throat> quite uh, extreme change. So this read is saying that this gets substituted with that, that um, and uh, we notice the positions of the variation all over the genome, which is not what we expect. So let's ex examine that a little bit further with um, thermal stats, just get some statistics about the mapping. So we want to run this on this SNPI data set, which is data set number 50. And while that's running, we want to uh, use the BAM coverage uh, plotter to look using the secret as our um, genome and the SNPI data. We want to see a, a, a plot of the depth of coverage across the genome. So here we have the results from um, our analysis of this uh, SRR data set. So let's have a look here. The SAMSO stat just gives you some statistics on um, the mapping itself. That's taking a little while to load here on my screen. And there we have it. So total sequences here. Uh, about nine um, million, um, and uh, split evenly between uh, the uh, read one, read two. But what got mapped? Only forty-three thousand. Okay, and uh, vast majority of reads were not mapped. Um, and then, if we look at the coverage plot. Then we see these small peaks of coverage, uh, but most of the genome doesn't have any reads mapped. So what we get here is very low coverage. And if we go back to the SNPI data, and if we go look at the um, SNPs table, and then we can see that in the variants that were predicted The um, evidence was low numbers, you know, 23 reads here, 13 reads there, 12 reads there. So this is not, um, they, uh, uh, these are not SNPs that we can really uh, have huge confidence in because uh, there's just, I mean, they, these are not nothing, but the, the depth of coverage is not nearly as high as uh, what we saw um, in our earlier example. Uh, so there's something definitely wrong. And I haven't run Kraken on this uh, data set to see uh, what species are present, but there's definitely something uh, wrong here with the sample. And um, it honestly does not look like one that I would want to use for uh, any further analysis. So that brings me to the last part of the tutorial, which is, so we've, just for the recap, we've looked at one good sample, 004-2, and we went through the analysis of that manually. We've looked at the 018-1 sample, which uh, seems to have not great quality and uh, a high uh, proportion of what might be contamination with uh, non mycobacterium tuberculosis. And we've looked at the SRR sample, which uh, this seems to not map very well to mycobacterium tuberculosis whatsoever. So just out of interest, I'm going to leave the Kraken run um, uh, running. Uh, I'm going to reuse these Kraken parameters, but now I'm going to run it instead of the 018 sample, I'm going to run it on the SRR sample. I'll leave this thing running while <coughs> I do the last part of our tutorial. So. Um, for this, I'm actually going to make a new history. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this button here, and I'm going to call this MTB workflow, because I'm going to be using a workflow just now. And so if you see the history is empty, but if I use the menu here, I can show history side by side. 
And let me take the uh, analysis from the other history. And I'm going to drag these data sets 0041002 and uh, the reference. And then I'm going to go find the uh, 018 samples. Did that show up? There is a copy and the other one. So now I've got uh, a relatively clean history to start from. And now I'm going to make a um, collection out of my reads. So I'm going to gather them all together. I'm going to select just the ones that uh, I'm interested in. I'm saying, going to say for those, build a list of that set pairs. It detects that the endings are underscore one, underscore two, and that these should match up. There are my uh, pairs. And I'm going to call these samples. Create, uh, create collection. And I'm going to switch off the multi-select mode. There it's hidden the original data sets and there it's made this uh, set called samples with forward and reverse. I'm just going to um, have a look at this. This is the <coughs> data sets. If I want to remove the dot fast queue um, from the sample IDs, then I would have to use a, a tool called the um, uh, collection from rules, uh, the rule border to uh, be more smart in terms of how I put my collections together, but uh, I'm not going to um, <clears throat> use that today. So I've got my samples and I've got my reference genome. And then I'll go back to the tutorial. So unfortunately, I've discovered a bug with the Scholar Hat View at the moment. It was meant to show you where to find uh, the workflow that I want you to run uh, on these samples. Uh, but um, that is not currently displaying. It is there if you look at the um, tutorial on training.galityproject.org. You can see here how to launch the workflow. But uh, since we are on usegalaxy.eu, uh, what I can do is I can go to workflows and I can go to public workflows. Just waiting for my interface to load up public workflows. And then I can search for tuberculosis. And here's MTB variance analysis version 1.0. This is the one that uh, I want you to use, not the other one, this one. Um, and then click run workflow. And then it finds the reads, our reads over here, this list of paired uh, end reads, and the reference genome, minimum depth of coverage, minimum variance allele frequency, and additional uh, BWMM options. Um, so a, a point here about this, the, these are uh, defaults, which are also defaults in Snippy. This BWMM option one, uh, um, Often that people have experimented with to remove the to reduce the risk of um, contamination reads map into the genome is to use this minus k parameter and set it to two thirds of the read length. So minus k 100 for 150 ba base pairs, etc. I'm not going to use that today, but some people have found this to be useful. So now I'm going to run the workflow, and then I get to see the workflow invocation scheme, screen, okay? Uh, so what we're seeing here is that it's scheduling the different steps of the workflow, basically computing what must come after what, um, and then it's running the various drops. So uh, we'll see in the, that these are the final outputs. They're still gray. They're still waiting for previous jobs to complete. Um, <clears throat> but we can see some of the processing happening here behind the scenes. Um, these are jobs that are already running. Um, and if we click into the details, then we can see what the different steps of the workflow are, um, computing the minimum depth of coverage, um, running uh, 
the uh, sorry, this was my parameter of depth of coverage running fast P running secret and so on and so forth. This is all busy running. Uh, I can if I navigate away from this view, so for instance, I go look at something here, um, then I can't see my workflow invocation anymore. But if I go back to the history, go to the history menu and I ask to show invocations in older galaxies, this was under the user menu. In the even newer galaxies, it has its own icon here on the side. Then I can see this is my workflow invocation when I invoke it then. And I can click this. And then I can see this progress bar <coughs> showing how it's running all the different steps. So what this workflow uh, comprises of, so if I go back to my workflow view and um, I go to the public workflows, And I look for that tuberculosis one. And then <clears throat> if I click on this, I click on the view button. Then I can scroll around and I can see the different steps. And these um, arrows here are how the data moves around. So here are the reads, they come into fast P. Uh, there's the reference genome. It also comes into uh, uh, comes in uh, the reads. Uh, after process with fast p gets sent to snippy and then the variants from snippy gets sent to tb variant filter the bam from snippy gets sent to tb profiler um then in fact a uh, two tb pro uh, 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 variant filter runs running the one over here at the bottom is if we look at it closely is running tb variant filter you'd have to edit the workflow to see its its details but basically this is only including the uh, single nucleotide variants. And then over here at the bottom, uh, minimum depth of coverage is passed through to the full MOS depth, which also takes the BAM output, computes areas of low coverage, and creates a mask that, that is fed into BCF towards consensus. So what that does is it takes the reference genome, converts it into FASTA, by secret over here, um, and it takes the single nucleotide variants um, computed by SNPI over there. Um, <clears throat> and it takes the mask, which identifies the regions where the coverage uh, and the genome drops below the minimum coverage. Um, and it puts it all together and it computes a cons consensus genome. So this is a consensus genome based on the reference genome masked off for low coverage and with the variants uh, included. This can be used later on. Uh, for building phylogeny. You'll see that in some of uh, other tutorials. And then here from the TB profiler, TB variant filter, uh, the text transform that we did uh, before um, <clears throat> to remove the gene underscore names, then that feeds into the TB variant report as we saw when we we're doing the tutorial manually. And the FASTP output uh, together with the uh, uh, BAM QC, which is a quality control tool for um, BAM mapping data, gets fed into multi QC, and we can see its output there. And also the fast P data output gets fed into Kraken. So there's the Kraken one as well. So these are all the different steps that get run by the workflow, and they all get run automatically. And we can see them if we go to our <coughs> Workflow invocations, we can see um, the steps running. And I'm I'm processing two samples here at the moment. If we look at the bottom here, this is um, the two samples, the 004-2 and the 018-1. And if we look at this progress, uh, one of the two samples is, uh, has been run in Snippy already. The other one is busy running. There's Kraken running. Uh, but the beauty of workflows is that we can make a collection of 10, 20, however many samples we've got. We can run the workflow. We can go away, do the do work for the rest of the day. When you come back, then <clears throat> the workflow will have completed um, and we'll have outputs for all of the uh, process samples. So, uh, you know, we have a collection coming in here, collection of pairs. And if we look at the outputs that are coming here, for instance, the TB profile profile report, 
we click on it, we see that it's also a collection. So there's the report drug resistance report on 018-1. There's the drug resistance report on 004-2. And now I know I said I didn't entirely trust the data here from 018-1, but I was just using it as an example for demonstrating how this workflow runs. So if we have a look here, what does it say? It has called a lineage uh, and it has called some uh, resistance, um, but the uh, proportions here are low compared to uh, what we saw before, 0.37%, I mean, over 37% um, of the reads are predicting um, resistance to amikacin. So some of these second line drugs, uh, kenamycin, capiramycin, um, and these are all in fact the same variants in the RRS. Uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> just looking at the complete history, TB profile is still finishing, multi-QC hasn't run yet, uh, some of the text transformation has run, so this is the annotated BCF has completed processing, we can look at it for each sample. So there's the zero four hyphen two, and there's the um, remember this is the nine hundred fifty nine lines. This is the uh, after CBBCF filters run. There's the zero eighteen hyphen one, which is five hundred fifty nine lines. Um, there's fewer variants here, um, for possibly because there's less good quality data to map uh, against the genome. And the different steps are still busy running. Some of this TB variant reporters uh, <clears throat> got here already because uh, the one part of the workflow for 018 happened one has completed running. And uh, let's just go back to the chain vacation view. We can see that most of the steps have now completed. Multi QC, it's finally taking all of the QC data and consolidating it. Uh, so then that will get up to 25 uh, when that's finished. The multi QC has finished. Um, and then we're still waiting for um, keep a profile to finish pro uh, uh, processing one of the samples. And let's have a look at multi QC so long. And we see here that the coverage for one of the samples, uh, it's not labeling them very nicely, but one of the samples was um, uh, 99.6 coverage that is uh, at greater than 30 times depth, that is the um, uh, 004-2 sample, the first one that we, we passed in, there, there you see there's the sample name, um, and then there's the second sample name, and we see that very small part of the genome was covered uh, to um, greater than 30 times. Um, median coverage was only 12 times, and uh, the GC content slightly off, perhaps some contamination going on there compared to what we expect. Um, the coverage histogram with the different samples. Uh, so remembering these weird names, so let's just look at this end with the 6-1. Uh, we see that mostly it's very poor coverage. Then this nice blue line here, uh, the one that ends with a 3-4. Um, uh, and we see that the Coverage is mostly over here on um, uh, almost 200 depth. Um, and then uh, we can also see in this graph, for the good sample cumulative genome coverage, um, <clears throat> almost 100% of the reference is uh, covered at uh, depth 
here of a hundred times. Whereas if you look at the bad sample, um, almost none of the uh, genome is covered at more than uh, 30 times coverage. Uh, then we see the GXC content, the good sample here, around 66%, something strange. The bad sample, 67%, which is not what we expect from mycobacterium and tuberculosis. And then we can get down to the fast P results. Much more reads in the good sample, much fewer reads in the bad sample, um, and uh, then so on and so forth. And we see here, this is the... Um, this, in fact, is the good sample over here, the 004-2, and we saw that it was only 100 base pair reads, and this is the bad sample, it's much longer reads, but then dropping down to not terrible quality, but well, actually pretty bad here towards the end. Um, so yeah, so this is a lot that we can read from the multi-PC report. We see that the drug resistance report has come out for both samples, And if we look at the implication, everything has finished running. There's tags to all the different things. So we can see this is a variant report, consensus genome, QC report, annotated BCF, drug resistance report, and then the Kraken reports have also finished running. So there we've got <clears throat> Kraken on the good sample and on the Definitely not so great sample. So this is all outputs, the same outputs as we saw when we were running the samples manually to a large extent, but now all run automatically for us by the um, uh, workflow. And the, the other advantage of using a workflow like, like this is that you can get an expert bioinformatician to help you craft a workflow, or you can just take one that they've crafted and run it, with, run it with some confidence that you are um, building on the work of uh, somebody who is an expert in, in their field. Okay, and that really brings the tutorial finally to an end.